To God be the glory. I want to warmly welcome you to First Presbyterian Church. As a congregation, we are humbled that once again this year the Martin Luther King Jr. Observance Committee has chosen our church to host this most important occasion in our city. We have specifically prayed that Dr. King's dream would not merely be remembered but exemplified in our true agape love for one another throughout this whole year. So in love, we welcome all faiths and creeds into this sanctuary for this civic event. At the same time, we want everyone to know that as a Christian church, whose mission it is to restore people and rebuild places through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe this kind of gathering is in line with our mission. We believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was powerfully raised to life to reconcile sinful people to a holy God. We also believe that that same gospel is powerful enough to reconcile people who would otherwise hate one another they may even dislike one another, but the gospel's powerful enough to make us one. We regularly and publicly repent of our church's racism in the distant past and not so distant past. And we join our hands with the leaders of this commemoration today to heal the wounds of our city. I appeal to my fellow Christian ministers to remember that Dr. King was one of us. Like him, we must lead our churches into repentance because the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be believed as good news unless it transforms very different people into one new people who worship together and do life together. At the National Cathedral on March 31st, 1968, <clears throat> just a few days before he was assassinated, Dr. King repeated that, that statement that he had made many times to his own congregation and to other congregations and gatherings across the country. He said, we must face the sad fact that at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning when we stand and sing, in Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, that this is the most segregated hour of America. It still is, but we pray fervently at First Presbyterian that God would cause the membership of this church to reflect the complexion of heaven. We pray that God would change us. And what if we all prayed and worked for the same in all our congregations? May God bring the day when someone will drive into our city, a visitor, and they'll say, where is the closest white church? Or somebody come in and say, where's the closest black church? Or Asian church? Or Hispanic church? And that guide will be forced to say, we only have churches. We don't have a black church. We don't have a white church. We don't have a Hispanic church. We don't have an Asian church. We just have churches. May that day come when we realize not just Dr. King's dream, but King Jesus' dream. All right, now let's get down to pragmatics. I have been charged by Bishop, Key, by Bishop Green and Reverend Fryer and the others to keep time. <laughs> Just like we did last year. You have honored us with your presence. We want to honor you by being respectful of your time. So every speaker, other than the keynote, has been allotted three minutes. It's up there on the back of the wall. <laughs> you can't see it, but the speakers can see it. It's a countdown clock. 
At two minutes and 30 seconds, there's going to be a beautiful echo from the organ. That 30 seconds is coming. At three minutes, after three minutes, the mic won't work anymore. And if they're standing here, this thing drops. We're going to be singing We Shall Overcome at 1.30 today. Amen? We're glad you're here. May I ask that uh, representatives of the various sections of our government please be, uh, stand when I announce uh, what you represent and let us express our appreciation to you. Would our newly elected mayor, our former mayor, and all members of the commission, and former members of the commission, would you please rise that we may say thank you to you. <laughs> Sheriff Roundtree and uh, members of law enforcement, would you please rise. All the representatives of the court, judges and others present, would you please rise that we may say thank you to you. <laughs> representatives of uh, Richmond County uh, and Columbia County administrations, would you please rise. <laughs> representatives of state and national government, would you please rise that we might recognize you. Now, with our Masters of Ceremony, Ms. Barclay Bishop and Mr. J. Jeffries, would you please take over the program? They said three minutes, Jay. Jay gets in front of a mic and you never know what's going to happen, huh? No, it's not about me today. It's about the dream. Keeping the dream alive. That's what it's about today, right? And uh, Reverend, I'm here to tell you I have the, uh, the privilege of bringing up our greeters, and I'm going to keep you guys to three minutes. And ladies, all right. First of all, give yourself a big round of applause for coming here to this joyous occasion. This is the 26th anniversary. This is a good time. I'm so glad to see everybody here on a good note, because we usually always gather, whether it's a, a funeral, or whether it's some bad news about something, but this is going to be a good day. The weather is fantastic inside and out, okay? So to carry on with our program, the scripture reading is going to be read by Pastor Young Sung Lee and the invocation by Pastor Hector Caceres. Today's scripture lesson comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Let me read in Korean first. 마지막으로 말하노니 형제들아 기뻐하라 온전케 되며 위로를 받으며 마음을 같이 하며 평안할지어다. 또 사랑과 평강의 하나님이 너 여호와 함께 하시리라. 거룩하게 입맞춤으로 서로 무난하라. 아멘. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and the peace will be with you. Amen. Dios le bendiga. What? That means God bless you. Hey, he speaks in Korean, I speak Spanish. By the way, you look great. And I can only imagine something like this in heaven. One day, all nations before the king. The 
going to be great. My name is Pastor Hector Cáceres, and I have the honor to be the pastor for one of the Hispanic churches here in Augusta. Our name is Ministerio Nueva Vida, that means New Life Ministry. And I was given the honor to do the invocation. Uh, please stand as we pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Yes, Jesus. To thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to also thank you for the legacy of our brother, Dr. Martin Luther King, whose main concern was always your kingdom and human rights. Speak to our minds and hearts today in this memorial service and help us be like Jesus and also like our beloved brother Martin Luther King. Forgive us if so far we fail to honor you in everything we do and give us the wisdom and the strength we need to always, always give you glory and honor. Father, this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. Would you please remain standing as we sing Lift Every Voice and Sing. Everyone can be seated now, and this is the time where we start our clock. 
Once again, thank you so much for getting us together. If you could just see you guys out there right now, this is wonderful, fantastic. I've always wanted to say this, let the church say amen. Oh, people up there too, we didn't forget you. All right, how you doing? First of all, for our greetings, I'm going to call them in pairs and be following this order, please. The Honorable Hardy Davis, the Mayor of the City of Augusta, followed by Dr. Ricardo Aziz, the President of Georgia Regent University. Good afternoon, Augusta. Dr. Robertson, thank you for setting the stage for a wonderful occasion. Today, we set aside the impressions of our past as we journey forward to One Augusta. As I look out into the audience, I see faces of individuals who are the very essence of what Dr. King stood for. We come today not only to celebrate the life and the legacy, but quite frankly, to continue the dream. As I look out into this audience, I want to leave you with a challenge. We've come today to convene an August body of individuals from across this community and across the CSRA. But let not our convening today end here. In the words of Dr. King, 1967, where do we go from here? I challenge you, let us go from here to a place where love moves us beyond hatred and strife. Let us go to the place of where love brings us together as a city, not a black city, not a white city. Let us go to the place of where love allows us to come together, roll up our sleeves, work together, live together, play together, raise a family together, and enjoy this wonderful city together. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Good morning. Good morning. I am honored to bring you greetings from the Georgia Regents University on this occasion of the 26th annual remembrance for Dr. Martin Luther King here at First Presbyterian in Augusta. For 26 years, good people have been gathering at this church to celebrate and to remember and to honor a visionary, a leader from our past, but was very, very important in today's present. We have all felt very disheartened recently by all the events across our nation and begun to wonder whether any progress has been made. Have we forgotten our path? But before we all acknowledge that much work remains to be done, let us also acknowledge that much, much has been made, much progress has been achieved. We should be thankful to Dr. King and Dr. King's courage to set the vision for us, to set the path forward, to guide us today as he did more than 50 years ago when we lost him. Let us remember that the road to human progress has never been sleek or smooth. It's always bumpy, full of issues, switchbacks, but we always eventually move forward. We move forward with the strength of our faith and with the courage, the courage of our leaders and the courage within, because that is the courage that Dr. Martin Luther King reminded us of. The courage to proceed forward, doing the right thing despite what those that were against him. On March 23, 1968, Dr. King spoke here in Augusta, only 12 days before we lost him. And he spoke to us and said, a dream of peace. Let them think of me as they like, he said. As long as breath is in my body, I am going to do whatever I can. Because it is courage that will continue to move us forward 
and courage that will ensure that we stay on the right path, the path that Dr. King reminds us and taught us. Thank you. Hustle up here before my, oh, we gonna start the clock now, okay. <laughs> it's good to be home. And it is a great honor to be here with you today to comm commemorate this important day for our country and to celebrate the remarkable life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This observance has been a very special event in our community for the last 26 years. And Reverend Larry Fryer, I want to thank you and Dr. Robertson, Dr. Green, for what you've done here. I'm honored to be your elected representative and to bring you greetings from the United States Congress. My wife, Robin, and I feel very blessed and humble to serve Georgia's 12th district in Washington. Washington is a city of history where great leaders have made a pro 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 uh, profound impact on our country and changed our nation for the better. Dr. King was certainly one of the greatest among them. In addition to his contributions as an iconic civil rights leader, we remember Dr. King as a man of abiding faith. His ministry served as the foundation of his lessons and teachings that will endure for generations to come. He was a fearless and transformative, transformative visionary who sought to bring our country together as one nation under God. He was raised up by God for this very purpose. When I was praying about what to say this morning, I wanted to share with you this scripture that talks about obedience. And Jesus said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know, he rushed up here so he get all his three minutes in. He got it, didn't he? That's all right. Coming to the podium now. <laughs> Honorable D. Cohen, you better run up here. Get it right on up. I got this. <laughs> Good afternoon. It is an honor to bring you greetings as we celebrate the life and legacy of a personal hero of mine, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This morning I was thinking that the mayor's office and Mayor Davis, I'm sure you'll find this every time, gives you a unique vantage point to see how his dream is being played out here in Augusta. And I will tell you, his dream is alive and well in Augusta. I saw it played out when this city was able to raise over $20 million to build the Crop Center, a facility that now serves citizens from all walks of life in this community during the worst recession in our lifetime. <clears throat> I, I saw it last, sprint, last fall when 77,000 people gathered in downtown Augusta to celebrate arts and culture at our annual Arts in the Hearts Festival. 
I saw it played out last winter when citizens from all walks of life came together during the worst storm in our lifetime to help weather that storm. And I saw it several years ago at the dedication of the Ju Judge John H. Ruffin Jr. Courthouse on James Brown Boulevard. But, but for me personally, I was able to experience in serving for, as mayor for nine years in a city where I can honestly say I was judged on the content of my character, not the color of my skin. So I just want to thank you all for being here today to celebrate the life of this great man. Thank you. And now the superintendent the Richmond County School, Dr. Angela Pringle. Okay, I'm cutting out the last page, all right? <laughs> in honor of, well first greetings, greetings from the Board of Education of Richmond County School System. In honor of the, uh, this wonderful day, the celebrated for a very, very great cause, I'm honored to be a part of an opportunity to pay tribute to a great man who fought for equality even when the odds were against him. Nothing could stop him from achieving what he wanted to achieve, even if it meant going to jail, being hated, or being disliked by those he loved. His speech, I Have a Dream, has touched the hearts of millions throughout the, the, the world and goes to show that all things are possible. Martin Luther King wrote in his college newspaper, The Morehouse Maroon Tiger, that we must remember that education serves a purpose of educating students not only at a high level of intellect, but also including character. We must address the character of a student when we're looking to educate at high levels. The complete education gives us not only the power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. In essence, we must be taught to think critically. We must go beyond those A's, B's, and C's, and those things that we sometimes think we're going to pass the test on. Uh, today we are wrought with distractions. We're wrought with distractions in a big way. Trending on topics such as a ban on homework, how to use the internet, ban on junk food in schools. Folks, we must concentrate. We must focus on what's really meaningful to our children. As standards increase, dollars to fairly compensate our teachers decrease, the dollars that are necessary to provide resources for our very needy students decrease, we must get back to our focus on the real work and not on those distractions. Historians and others who studied Martin Luther King will tell you that part of what made him a wonderful person were the attributes, the tremendous attributes that I teach my own students that include patience, bravery, leadership, and persistence. These are not only the four, only four of the attributes that made him great, they're just a start. As our Board of Education and employees from across the district unified to improve the quality of education in our district for all boys and girls, know that patience, brave and bold leadership, and persistence will be required from everyone, including you. I have 26 seconds. <laughs> But please note that the full attention will be on our boys and girls in our community that make a difference. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> you know, this is one of my parents, and I feel cheated. I didn't get my full three minutes. I got 30. I want y'all to know I got 30 seconds, so I'm going to get you, okay? <laughs> I'm going to the principal's office now. <laughs> I tell you what, Pastor, that clock is, boy, it's something. I like it. <laughs> and finally, we'd like to bring, bring to the podium, you better run. Judge William Jenkins come up, coming up here, boy. looking on your programs for my name and <laughs> you're saying, Bill, why are you up there? I don't see your name. Well, I'm what they call a stealth speaker. 
That means I only have two minutes, not three. <laughs> and it's appropriate, I'm a stealth speaker, so I'm, I'm chief judge of a stealth court. When they dedicated the new building, they forgot to put civil court on the dedication plaque. And they said, Bill, do you want us to go back and make a new one? I said, I don't know, how much does it cost? They said, $18,000. I said, no, we're not going to do that. I said, just do a handwritten sign and say, Bill's court is in here too. <laughs> History takes time to write, and there are two things that we know now with the passage of time. We lost Dr. King roughly half a century ago. Two things are certain. One is that 20th century gave America very few great men and women. And the other is that Dr. King was one of them, one of the very few. But he didn't have to be great. He could have stayed on Dexter Avenue at his church, fine small church, given wonderful sermons to his small congregation who would have loved it, been surrounded by his loving family, had a safe, quiet, happy, long life, but he did not. He made the choice. He made the choice to go in harm's way and walk dangerous streets and march those streets, and he did, and he paid the price, but we reached the reward. He preached not to a small congregation, but first to hundreds and then to thousands and then to tens of thousands, and finally in the big speech to 200,000. And in doing so, he spoke for the people. And in speaking for the people and taking these steps, he allowed himself to be treated like a common criminal. He was arrested, handcuffed, slept in jail. Something that young people today, I don't think, understand carries a moral value because to a man of the cloth in that era, this was a terrible stigma. Today, it seems like every other person has a DUI on the record. They really don't care. This matter. This matter. He also went out in search of justice, justice for everyone, because he knew if everybody didn't have justice, it didn't exist. He knew that justice comes from the Latin word justitia. Justitia means that now I sit down because I hear a piano. <laughs> we're going to turn it over to the pastor, but before we do that, uh, we're going to do our offering portion of our program. And if you are making a check out, please make it out to the Martin Luther King Jr. CSRA. Please make it out if you for check for Martin Luther King Jr. CSRA. Let's pray and set this offering apart for the good of our city and for the glory of God. Our Heavenly Father, you are the one, the Father of lights from whom all gifts come. There is no shadow of turning in you. We give these gifts to you and ask that Dr. King's legacy would be furthered, that the designated charities will be the recipients of these funds, that these charities which directly impact the good of our citizenry, the least of these, the disenfranchised, the marginalized, we pray that they would be benefited by our generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
standing up. I was trying to shimmy up myself, and Jay said no. Uh, keeping on with our program today, we're going to welcome Bishop L.A. Green Sr., the pastor of Light of the World Evangelistic Outreach Ministries. Thank you, Barkley. We're going to have um, Mrs. Rhonda Sam come up. Praise the Lord with those uh, trophies. She works out of the central office with Dr. Pringle. Amen. She's... Uh, one of the young ladies that are moving forward in Augusta, along with uh, Sister Coretta Williams, amen, MLK Observance Committee member. We're getting ready for our honorees to come up. Every year, we honor somebody in the name of Dr. Martin Luther King with the Humanitarian Award, someone who has done something very unique in our community, someone who's recognized, someone who has been done, doing a real, real good job. So therefore, today, we're going to be recognizing two people that I think has done an outstanding job. First, we're going to ask one of our black queens, Mrs. Barbara Gardner. She is the, praise the Lord. Come on up, Barbara. The editor and publisher of the Metro Carrier. Let's give her a great hand. Will the staff members please come up? Come on, staff. We have less than three minutes. <laughs> and you can just stand right here. Yeah, it'd be great. It is good to have staff members with you. Family. The Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Service 2015 being held here in the city of Augusta, the Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award is presented to Mrs. Barbara Gardner, 30 years of service as publisher and editor of the Metro Carrier newspaper. Because of your zeal to report the number one stories every week without wavering, and your outstanding and credible courage to report the news across the nation, city, and community, and your undying and unwavering willingness to minister with the, to minister to the ministers with the real state, real, well, real facts, praise the Lord, I'm sorry, of the news while not neglecting to report all other news involving other nationalities. We thank you on this day of January 19th, 2015, for your deep and devoted dedication for reporting the real news to all the people of the CSRA, presented to you by Bishop Ellie Green, Sr., President of the MLK Observance and the MLK Observance Committee. Thank you, sir. Uh, just let me collect myself for a second. This is such an honor. It's a wonderful thing. It's a special thing when someone thinks enough of what you do for a living to recognize it. Uh, I've asked my staff to come up because putting a newspaper together every week is a hard and tedious job. But we do it because we love it. We do it because we're dedicated. We do it because we're committed to the legacy of the black press. We do it because we love this community. Uh, I too have a dream, just like Dr. King. And my dream is that one day our city will realize this oneness that our mayor speaks of. It's possible. 
And if not totally possible, I know it's for at least 80% 80, 80 possible. But I also hope that one day our leaders will realize that doing the right thing is unconditional and non-negotiable. Thank you. Also, after I've settled myself down, there's a young man in our community that I'm really, really proud of. And he's doing a good job within the HUD department. This is a young man that is dedicated to doing the will of God here in Augusta, Georgia. He's a young man who has impressed me greatly. Matter of fact, one of his things have been embedded into my soul, and I thank God for him. He's a young man that is encouraging other young men and women to come back here to Augusta to help build this city back up to the number one or either number two city in the state of Georgia. His words that is embedded in my heart is he have left Moe House to come back and work in his house, which is Augusta, Georgia. And I think that is powerful. None other than our son from Augusta, Georgia, Ralph Hawthorne Welcher. Come on, let's give him a hand. Hawthorne Welcher Jr. He's along with his wife and his father, Hawthorne Welcher Sr. And his wife, let's give them a hand as they come. To present and read this plaque to you is going to be Mrs. Praise the Lord, Rhonda Sams. The Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Service in 2015, the city of Augusta, Georgia. The Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award is presented to Mr. Hawthorne Welcher Jr. Interim Director of Augusta Housing and Community Development Department on January the 19th, 2015. For your outstanding work that you have done immediately after you took over this office, along with the Augusta Commissioners and the City Engineer for completing the mission to relocate the remaining High Park residents. We honor you for your dedicated service to the citizens of Augusta, Georgia, through the, de through the development of human capital, capital building neighborhood capacity and by addressing the needs of low to moderate income families through the administration of federally and state funded programs and for the great rapport that you have with the housing staff and your leadership ability to make Augusta Housing and Community Development Department second to none in the state of Georgia. Presented by Bishop Ellie Green Sr., Vice President of the MLK Memorial Services, and Chairperson of the CSRA Clergy Board of Directors. I'll be very brief. First, give honor to God, honor to God, who's the head of my life. Uh, as I stand here today, one thing that's been very, very important and prevalent to me is the fact that it's never I, it's we, and it's never me, it's us. So with that, I must thank some persons before I go to my seat. First, I want to thank the Oversight Committee, led by Bishop Green. I really, really appreciate this honor because I know that there were other honorable people on the ballot as well. So I thank you, you know, for this, this dubious award. Also, I want to thank Mom and Dad. Mom, I thank you for always being a cheerleader, even though when things were not right, you were always still a cheerleader. Dad, I also want to thank you for actually being a beacon of light, a beacon of leadership. And I really, really appreciate you making me a legacy and making me a junior. And I have continued that on. Sweetie pie, wifey. <laughs> Let me just say thank you for standing beside me and not behind me. I also want to thank my daughter, Zion, and my son, H3, Hawthorne III, who's not here today. Would also like to have my brother and his wife, Trevor Welcher, to stand. Uh, also, my staff at the Housing and Community Development Department, Sonia Johnson, I see Tiffany, I don't see anybody else. Would you all please stand as well? Also, definitely would be very remiss 
if I did not thank uh, Mayor Corbin Haver, also Mayor Davis, Mrs. Jackson, and other members of the commission for believing enough in me to actually help me further my career. Before I go to my seat, but when I think of service, I think of three things. As a student at Morehouse College, and as I matriculated on, matriculated on to become a Morehouse man, we actually had to go what, what, to what was considered crown service every Thursday in the King Chapel. So if Dr. King was here today, there would be three things that he would want me to actually leave with you all today. And the first thing would be 2,500 plus one. You may say, okay, what is that? Well, 2,500 plus one actually is 2,500 plus one seats in the chapel. The plus one means that there's always room for one more brother or one more sister. So I challenge each of you all to always make room for one more. Another thing that I will tell you that I would pee on you if Dr. King was here today, and that would be the fact that inscribed in the King Chapel, it says that we have learned to fly the skies like birds, and we have learned to swim the seas like creatures, but we've yet to live together as humans, as one brother and one sister. So I challenge all of you all today to, if, if you haven't done it any time in your life, to try and challenge to live together in one accord as one brothers and sisters. And last but not least, and one thing that's dear to my heart, and I will go to my grave with this saying, and I challenge you all to live the rest of your days, and that is, the greater your sacrifice, the greater your reward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rhonda Sam Leverett and Ms. Coretta Williams. Let's give them a hand as they go to the seats. I just want to say before I leave um, that I want to thank Jay and Barkley for really coming and the, accepted the invitation. And I thank you for really coming and doing this for us, you know, emceeing the program. Also want to thank uh, Pastor Roberts, praise the Lord, for giving us a second chance to come and be here in this service. Also want to I thank all the guest speakers that have invited, and most of all, Pastor Gooden. God bless you. I asked him last year, sitting right down there, and he accepted it. And he's a man of his word, and he's here today. And I thank God for you. The mayor, Mayor D. Covenhaven, I truly thank you for what you, what you have done with me and Larry. I truly thank you for that. Through a lot of hard times, a lot of arguing and bickering, you constantly talked to me and talked to Larry, and you finally got us together to combine one service. I truly thank you very much. I love you for that. I also want to say, Larry, I thank you for serving with you and all the good times that I've had. Amen. We <laughs> We've had some good times. Larry is in a position now that he can take this program on. And I thank uh, Pastor Roberts for doing that for us. He really was close in really getting us together this year also. So Pastor Roberts, thank you for your dedicated service, of making sure that we are one, no matter what color we are. We thank God for that. So Larry, as I stand here, I want to say that I'm going to resign. And I hope that you have somebody to take my place. And I know you're going to move it on. But I want you to know one thing, it was good serving with you, and it was good serving with the committee. <laughs> Mayor? Judge David Watkins is here and he's hiding. He's my mentor and he's blessed me tremendously. But hopefully I'll see him before he leaves. He's up in the balcony. God bless Augusta. God bless our politicians. God bless you, Wayne. Continue to do what you're doing. Dr. Pringle, we love you. Ms. Jackson, welcome aboard. We thank all of you for doing such a great job. My queen, I love you. Thank you, ma'am. Let's give God a hand. And I can't forget my leader, 
Chef Rongtree. Serve on his board. Thank you, Chef. Man, oh man, Pastor Goodman, he asked you to, to be the speaker and you were there. He caught me in the parking lot at the school and told me about it, boy. All right. <laughs> about to make me cry. <laughs> We're going to have an introduction of our speaker now. <laughs> Reverend Norman Kelly, come on up. <laughs> man, I just need a hug. That's all I need. Protocol being established, honored guests to the leadership and fellowship of the First Presbyterian Church, program participants, guests, good afternoon. Amen. As we gather here today at this 26th anniversary CSRA Memorial Observance of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. commemorating his life, the best way to remember, think of, and honor him is to take to heart his example <clears throat> through our living, thought, word, and deed so that his legacy will live on forever. Based on his Christian beliefs, Reverend King achieved greatness by resisting the world and through service and love for all people, dubbing him a drum major for God. Dr. King was a preacher. Thanks be to God that he is still raising up preachers. We have in our midst today a preacher extraordinary in the person of Reverend Dr. Charles E. Goodman, Jr., pastor teacher of the historic Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia, who is a drum major for God and is destined for greatness. Pastor Goodman is educated spiritually, academically, and is intellectually sound, a quick thinker who is strong in spirit. His consistent, steadfast work for the kingdom of God, compassion for humanity, graphic style of preaching have not gone unnoticed. He has been recognized by media magazine newspaper and has received numerous awards for his unwavering work for Christ. He is also the author of three books, You Can't Run From Purpose, Road to Recovery, and The Flip Side of Favor. Since being elected and accepting leadership of the Tabernacle Baptist Church, he the church continues to grow numerically, spiritually, and geographically. With the launch of Tabernacle West in Evans, Georgia this year, we are now one church in two locations. God has shown favor not only on Tabernacle, but the community at large by sending to us this dynamic, anointed preacher, teacher, and visionary who does not rest on past achievement, but is always seeking ways to move from good to better, from better to great, and from great to greater. We at Tabernacle Baptist Church believe that eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard what the Lord is going to do through this man of God. Not only at Tabernacle, but everywhere his presence is experienced. Because we believe the best is yet to come. So after this choir gives us another selection, will you join me in receiving him when he comes to the podium? Thank you very much.
pray together in this place. God, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here to celebrate the legacy of one who has given us so much hope, gave us a dream to pursue. We thank you for the precious privilege of us being in this place together in one accord and unified. God, our desire is that we will honor you in all that we do. So thank you for those who participated thus far and who have given wonderful insight and great reflections. Now, God, give us the opportunity to share and impart, to challenge and to encourage. I know my assignment in this place. Speak truth to power. Give me that chance right now. Give me boldness and courage. Where I'm confused, give me clarity. And I ask this for a few moments, that once we leave here, we'll not leave the same, but we'll, we, we'll leave encouraged and strengthened and motivated to do more for you. This is our prayer. In the precious name of our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. So good to be here. And once again, we are so thankful and honored to share in this wonderful place and to a great opportunity to share. Let me, first of all, thank those who are so uh, putting this wonderful program together for our, our city. Let's thank this board, this coalition. We thank God for them. Uh, for helping us to put this together. <laughs> to my covenant brother, my brother from another mother, who's a great friend of mine, pastor of this great church, Pastor Robinson. Let's thank God for him um, for being here and sharing with us. And this great church of First Presbyterian, we thank you for this opportunity to come and stand and thank you for your hospitality in trying to be our great host for this wonderful event. To all of our officials, to our mayor, to our preceding mayor, to all of our elected officials and great people who are here in this city, to our superintendent, to our sheriff, thank you so much for being here. Others throughout this place, it's just good to be in this house. I am honored to stand today and there is no greater honor than I have than being a child of God, being a grandson of Mother and Deacon Swan, but I have no other greater honor than the pastor of the greatest church in the universe to me, the Tabernacle Baptist Church. So I'm so thankful for them. Thank you so much. You are incredible. Tabernacle, if you're in the house, just wave at your pastor. Just good to see you. All right. They rolled out. So our music ministry, thank you. I wanted them to wave their hands because uh, just in case you say anything negative, they have permission. Uh, to, we love the Lord, but we don't play about that over at Tabernacle. So it's good to really be here. I'm always honored to have these opportunities to stand. I say this every time I go because I'm not really a good public speaker. So I'm always amazed that people would show up to listen to what I would have to say. So I'm thankful for you coming here for these few minutes. Now listen, I don't want this piano to play on me, so I'm going to do my best to stay within the allotment of time that I have. Always good to see my staff, and thank you to Reverend Kelly who helped us in a tremendous way. There is a word I want to share, and hopefully briefly, but it's a word that is really pressed upon my heart. And it's a signet and just a little snippet of scripture that's found in Hebrews chapter 11, around verse 4, that I meditated on as I would ask God, what would you have me to say in times such as these? Because I believe that we have to take these moments to be prophetic, to speak truth to power. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, just a small snippet of that scripture says, By faith, Abel is still speaking, even though he is dead. That passage really just began to stir things in my spirit. And once again, it says, By faith, Abel is still speaking, even though he is dead. If I was to put a tag on little talk that we're going to have today. I want to talk about the king is still speaking. We're sharing this moment as we come as a marvelous opportunity for us to remember a man who just in 39 years of life changed the world. Can you imagine that? Just 39 years. It makes me want to up my game. I'm 35. Only got four more to go to try to catch <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Person who won Nobel Peace Prizes, person we know because of his great speeches. But their in essence of himself is so much greater. And I'll be honest with you, I come to this moment and to this holiday with bittersweet emotions because I do think that as the time has passed, we've canonized Dr. King without understanding the true message that he tried to reach and teach. It's easy to put him up into this wonderful uh, ideals that we have him, but we understand that not only was he a priest, he was a prophet, and in his time, he was not that well received. Sounded wonderful to hear his story of racial reconciliation, especially now, but in the time that he was afforded to be able to speak it, it was not that well received. And if we'll be honest, his message went farther beyond racial reconciliation and also about economic disparities being overturned. He really had a dream, an ideal that was supposed to be for all of humanity, having all kinds of rights and living as God's people. 
As I began to listen to his sermons, and I'll be honest with you, I have a different experience. I was not born in that time. I was born in 1979. But I was raised by my grandparents who had a tremendous experience and a tremendous impact on my life and how I view things. They grew up in the civil rights era. His grandfather was raised as a sharecropper with his family. He had to go through an unjust period trying to get work. And I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is known as one of the hubs of the civil rights movement, as we saw the sit-in take place in a little store downtown called Woolworth. And we remember those moments, and that was ingrained in me as my grandparents made sure that I remembered how the pain was, that the things and the joys that I take for granted now was not easy. Can you imagine the moments that most of our ancestors and foreparents had to share, not just through the humility of slavery, but also the humility of having water hoses put on you and dogs put on you simply because you wanted to enact in the very right of trying to vote. We are not even half a century away from all of those things. And I will admit to you, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And if the truth be told, that is the reality. That's why we're here. And I'll admit to you, it's wonderful to be in this nice, wonderful, cozy sanctuary. But yet, I wonder, what would Dr. King still say now? With all the things that we see going on, there is so much ineptitude, so much injustice. And yet, we still will come to our holiday moments. We took this day off. We came in to give our few moments of reasonable service. We've allowed the clock to run. But what are we doing? What would he say about many things that's happening now? What would he say about the injustices in Ferguson, the injustice that we see in Chicago, the injustice of the bombing in Paris? What would he say about those two cops who were assassinated in New York? What would he say about those people that are being killed daily in Nigeria, also in Chicago? And what would he say even in our own hometown of Augusta, Georgia? There's still some challenges that we're living with. I wonder, just as Abel, even though he's dead, he's still speaking. The challenge for all of us is what do we do with this thing because we have been given a mandate. Listen, we have made his ideal the dream, but I wonder, are we not turning the dream into a nightmare? That, that's really what causes us this challenge today. And I began to meditate on this and wonder, what is it? As I look at that story of Cain and Abel, Abel was the one who tried to do right by God, but his own brother was his own downfall. And because he could not answer the question, could he be his own brother's keeper? But you know the story, those that read scripture understand that his blood just began to declare and cry out on his behalf. I wonder, does the dream, does the memory, does the work of Dr. King still encourage us and strengthen us today? I'll imagine, I'll tell you this, I am a preacher. You can say amen throughout my speech. It does not bother me one bit at all. So I want you to understand how then can we move in that way? What does King mean for us today? He's bigger than something we put on a church program. He's bigger than something we put on a club flyer. He has to be something greater because the dream is still speaking. I wonder today if I was to give us some thoughts to ponder, perhaps there's some things that we need to understand about ourselves and if we could see how the king is still speaking. The first thing I would believe that if he had an opportunity to share with us today, that he would let us all know we have to be committed to justice for all. It's an important thing, I know that may sound a little antiquated, and I know understand that sometimes that sounds so wild, but we must understand that all of us deserve justice. You do understand what justice is. It's not always about being right, and God is not fair, but he is just. Which means that he operates with no prejudice. His whole idea is that for those who are the least of these to struggle, but when I read scripture, we began to see this great radical revolutionary book. I know many of us look at it as some spiritual addendum, but it is a book of liberation and power and emancipation. And it is always a book of struggle about those who are trying to reach justice. As you listen to the prophet of Isaiah who gives us this particular word, he gives a harrowing excuse where he says that it seems like truth is stammering in the streets. As he began to look prophetically, I wonder, did he not peer into the 21st century? Because sometimes we feel... Like truth is stammering in the streets. But I'm reminded that that great prophet, that Old Testament prophet by the name of Amos, many of us don't know him. He's a little one they would call one of those minor prophets, but he has a major message. And when you begin to study his particular book, you realize that Amos really believed in this understanding of justice. I appreciate Amos. His name literally means to lift a burden. During the time of his own uh, uh, prophetic musing, what he was sharing during that time, Amos was literally a young shepherd. If you study his background, he, he was a shepherd boy that lived in the territory of Judah, but Judah at the time was being oppressed by Israel. Their own people was oppressing them. 
People who were supposed to be the children of God were the ones that were causing them some problems and pain. And one day, Amos decides to put down the shepherd's staff. He decides to make a beeline to the capital there in Israel. And there he sees the ineptitudes, the injustices. He talks about how he sees the struggles of the things that's going on. But if you read his book, Amos, around chapter 5, you'll note that a lot of the challenges he saw was not on the roadside, wasn't in the highways, it was in the temple. Well, the people who are supposed to be pious, the people who are supposed to love God were the main ones in acting the injustices he was seeing. He saw the economic disparities. He saw the gender issues happening. It was Amos who began to have problems. He talked about how can we show up in church and the temple and give God praise. God doesn't hear our praise if our hearts are not correct. He, he said that kind of stuff. And, but in the midst of it, he came with a wonderful thing where he says it, and we hear Martin Luther King that quoted it, let justice roll down like a mighty rushing river. Note what he says. He said, I see the problems, I see the pains, I see the issues, I see all that's happening, but the only way it can be enacted and changed is that justice has to roll down like a mighty river. Now, I'm a student of scripture and I appreciate the verbiage for which Amos uses because that term for mighty rivers was not a river that we would think as some twinkling creek as it would parade through some land. It was not the most common word for river in the Bible of sea where you get Galilee, but he took it to Mishpat, which is found in Genesis 1, that creative part of God when God turned and moved from the ground to be the water. He said, we need that kind of overflowing water like justice. Because something has to be strong enough to cover the extremity of the problems and things that we're facing. It's only going to take God's hand of justice that's going to allow us. But we have to be his instruments to allow him to flow through us to get justice for all. I tell people this all the time. I believe all lives matter. My heart hurts for those parents that lose their kids with injustice as much as my heart hurts for those families of cops that got. I, my heart hurts for those who struggled in Paris as much as my heart hurts for those in Nigeria. I got to come to the place that justice for all means exactly that. We have to be committed to that. And part of our challenge, and you know how it is, many times we only want to deal with those that we see close to us. But I heard Martin Luther King said one time, an injustice anywhere is a threat against justice everywhere. We have part of our lives that must make that commitment to justice for all. If King was still speaking, he challenged us to continue to be the thoroughfare that allows justice to flow through us. But not only do I believe he says that we must be committed to justice for all, but I also believe that he would tell us we should believe in the beloved community. It's an interesting notion, and I would tell you it's a very strong notion that is basically presented in his whole idea of what love really means. I know we have oftentimes commercialized love. I know Valentine's Day is coming soon, and so we assume that love is just something you put on a Hallmark card. It's something that you give your sweetie on a wonderful holiday as a balloon, but love is so much deeper than that. Matter of fact, when Jesus begins to talk about it, he puts it up there as one of the two great commandments to do love God, but he also said love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 5 is where he interprets that particular passage, and I tell people all the time that when he does it, you got to understand how radical Jesus was in trying to say love your neighbor. Because from an Old Testament perspective, when that was written, the Jews believed in such demarcation. You love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. They believe in a segment where I love those who are close to me. I love those who live in my community. I love those who look like me. In the Old Testament, they would love those who they thought they could connect with, they thought was in their community. But if you were an outsider, I had no love for you. I, I wasn't obligated to love you. I, you was an outsider. You are my enemy. I hate my enemy, but love my neighbor. That's why I tell people when you read Scripture, New Testament is merely just... An exploration to view scripture through the lens of grace because Jesus takes that demarcation where they said, I love my neighbor, but I hate my enemy. He says, no, you love your neighbor as yourself because you should also love your enemies. He said, listen, that's what makes you a true believer. You can always love people that connect with you. I was on the way here 
Reverend Kelly was driving me here and we were listening to one of the radio stations had some of the, the sermons and speeches of Dr. King playing and it was actually at this point he began to talk about this whole notion of love and he began to talk about how unique and spectacular this idea of love is and from a scriptural standpoint how love comes in a multitude of ways. We know love from an eros which is that intimate type of love. We know love as phileo which is between two people on a friendship level but he says our belief is that we should love with agape love. Agape is that universal, unconditional love. I love the way Martin Luther King put it. He said that really agape love is God's love expressed through the human heart. I wonder how many of us, if we'll be honest with ourselves, struggle because we are not as good as love as we need to be. Listen, I tell people all the time that come to me for pastoral advice, we're not commanded to like, we're commanded to love. Matter of fact, it's not even given as a suggestion. We're all supposed to love one another. I don't have to agree with you to love you. That's the thing. You know how we are. We can be finicky sometimes. Unless I agree with everything about you, then I don't feel I can love you. Come on, let's be honest. We don't even agree with ourselves 100% of the time. But how are we going to believe and agree with everything else? We are commanded to love. And that was the ideal of Dr. King. He said, I want a place where there be beloved community. And it's wonderful to see us here once a year, but it seems it only happens once a year. It's a struggle. I, I know how it is. I understand. We all have different worship styles, but I understand we don't have to be just one Augusta in church. We ought to be one Augusta in the marketplace, one Augusta on the river watch. We ought to be one Augusta in every area of our lives because that's what it really is about. That's how the bonds of our companionship and fellowship is forged through our belief that we have love together. If he was here, he'd tell us to commit to justice for all. If he was here, he would tell us to believe in the beloved community. When was the last time you showed love? Love covers a multitude of sins. But as I lesson to my seat, the final thing I want to share with you today, that if King was still speaking, I believe that he would want us to orient our conscience to that of action. Because it's easy to talk about justice. It's, it's easy to talk about love. But at what point does the rubber meet the road, as my grandma used to say? At what point are we going to engage in the reality of doing something to enact and make the dream a true manifestation? That there's wonderful opportunities for us not just to sit down and worship, but to engage the opportunity to make sure that we are making an impact, making some kind of role and some kind of example of this notion of love. And one of those that I read in scripture is that great story out of Luke chapter 10. It talks about this notion. And then when you read it, it's oftentimes an, an oxymoron because in their context, you couldn't be good and a Samaritan at the same time. You know, the Jews had a lot of issues with the Samaritans. They, they worshipped in different places. They, they basically thought they were half-breeds. But G Jesus uses this whole parable of a good Samaritan to teach those who are listening to him this idea of who is your neighbor. You know that story in Luke chapter 10. And oftentimes we focus so much on the Samaritan. And yet we should. This man who saw someone in the ditch on the side of the street picks him up, cleans him up, takes him to a place to get shelter. But who I began to have the issue with is not the Samaritan. I appreciate him stepping outside of himself. He could have stayed on the other side of the road. But there were two people that saw this man hurting before the Samaritan showed up. And when you read that scripture, they are people of cloth. They are faith people. They are believers. They are folk that would show up at MLK observance religious services. Yeah, that's good. You know. Good spiritual people, good Bible toting, loving the Lord, singing amazing grace type people. But they had an opportunity to pick somebody up that was in need. And instead of them, the text says, as they saw him struggling, instead of going by asking, was he all right? It said something so powerful to me, they went to the other side of the street. They were so disgusted by this need felt they didn't want to do anything with it, they crossed the street. The question I have to ask, I wonder how many of us are still crossing streets today? How many of us are see a need and we still in such a hurry that we can't help anybody else? How many of us 
cross the street when we know our kids need help in the schools? How many of us are still crossing the street when you know we still have an economic problem, we still have more poor than we can handle? How many of us are still crossing the street because we'd rather show up at political rallies than try to help those who really need to have some help. How many of us are still crossing the street when there's a need? And I tell people all the time, when you are a follower of Jesus, he gives you a radical revolution. He gives you things that ought to make you do what he's called. As a matter of fact, his inaugural sermon in Luke chapter 4 was, I came to set the captives free. I come to feed those who need it. I come to make a difference. As I leave you today, I want you to know any work that you can do, you ought to do it for the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 25, as his parable that Jesus gives, he said, the king went to him and told him, I just thank you because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. And what I loved that about that, he said, when, you was, when I was sick, you visited me. And Jesus concludes it by saying, what you do for the least of these. You have done for me. You, you don't need a platform to serve. You don't need a position to serve. You don't need a special day to serve. You, any day is a good day to make a difference in somebody's life. All of us have opportunities to stand and touch somebody and make that difference. So what happens to the dream is the question. That is there. What happens to this dream? Are we going to continue to meet year in and year out? Yeah, we applaud the fact that there's a wonderful monument in Washington, D.C. But what is happening to the dream? Because the dreamer has died. But what happens to the dream? Same thing happened in Scripture in Genesis 37. You know that story. Joseph, that man that had a coat of many colors. Brothers hated him because God favored him and the Bible says they decided to throw him in the pit and they came up with a rhetorical question. What now about his dream? I would tell you though, Pastor Davis, I, I, I've learned that you got to be careful when you throw things in the pits. You do know that a pit ain't nothing but a dream. And last time I checked, whenever you try to put God's destined ones in a grave, the last one I knew that got thrown in a grave, I hear three days later. He got up with all power. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Well, God bless who's going after that. <laughs> Reverend Fryer is up next, a dear friend, a great man. We are happy to have you. It is your turn, and I don't know if you have a three-minute limit or not, but that music will let you know. I don't, but I'm still going to be brief. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is the 26th anniversary of this project and we've had many valleys, many hills and I see many of you who have been a part of us along the way. We want to thank God for you and for your input in making this what it is. So we celebrate today and we thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Charles Goodman for an outstanding job. and for his choir from Tabernacle. One day outstanding. <laughs> Mr. John Lewis and all those who worked with him and all of our special musical guests who did a marvelous job today. We thank God for them, for what they have done. We also thank God for this great pastor Pastor Robertson, who's opened his doors two years in a row for the Martin Luther King Memorial Observance. Let's give him some love, everybody, for this great church, First Presbyterian Church, for the outstanding job that they have done, making everything convenient for everybody who's here. To our master and mistress of ceremonies, uh, Ms. Barbara Bishop and Mr. J. Jeffries. A great job. 
NBC. All of our other program participants and all of you who brought us your greetings, we thank you for making this possible. But let me specifically and especially recognize one of your greeters who is Dr. Angela P a Pringle because she's my boss. So I want to make sure I say something about her. She's done, all of you have done a great job. Uh, we thank you for your giving. We received, uh, I think, about $3,000 plus today. We have got some directives from the church, and I'm going to respect those. And we are going to support the, the uh, King Center in Atlanta, the other charities, and of course, you will see over here all of the other donors who helped us to make this possible. And we want to thank, thank you so very much. Bishop Green, great job. Thank you so very much for what you've done. It's a beautiful lady here at this church and others are with her who worked with us to make sure this happened. Miss Jess Romer, we thank her. And of course, Miss Rozier, uh, who did a lovely, lovely artwork. We thank her so very much for that. So we appreciate everybody in your respective places for everything you've done to help make this day possible. I personally want to thank a young man out, uh, who has come aboard with us and he helped to do our publicity and that's Reverend Chris Waters from Thankful Baptist Church. Thank you so very much. We indeed are honored and we also want to let you know that I would not be remiss that I spoke to Reverend Robertson for the use of this church, they have not charged us anything both years. They have been a host. But this year, I'm gonna make sure that we do something for them in addition to what they have done for us. So we thank you so very much. We appreciate everyone. We can't name you all, but God can name you because he's the one that we do it for. Amen? Amen. We're going to ask two persons, uh, in addition to those who are standing here, uh, we can't get everybody up here, but we do want to have the new mayor and, of course, uh, Dr. Pringle to come and stand with us as we sing, uh, We Shall Overcome, and then we will have our benediction. Will you please come with us? And we're gonna stand together. Some of you others who might want to, I don't wanna leave nobody out. Come on, Congressman. And, and come up here with us. Let us stand together. And then we will have the benediction.
remain standing, please. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, give the benediction in two languages. One language from the Hebrew Old Testament by the Old Testament priests, so that we can be twice blessed. Would you raise your hands with me and receive the benediction? May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord show his favor to you. May he show you mercy. May he lift up his voice and show you favor. We are shame, laka, shalom, and may he grant you his peace. Amen. 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 You are definitely invited to the reception.